In my previous two videos, I've been discussing overshoot in critically and then heavily damped oscillating systems. And what I want to do now is first talk about the idea of damping time scale, and then show you how you can use this concept to derive the overshoot conditions that I derived previously, but this time using a simple uh, physically intuitive argument rather than going through a lot of maths. Um, so to start with, I want to again just briefly um, you know, present the key equations just for some context. So we've got our equation of motion um, for a harmonic oscillator, right, which is x double dot plus 2 gamma x dot plus omega naught squared x is 0, where x is the um, displacement and gamma and omega naught relate to the, the damping and the spring constant, um, respectively, of the system. All right, and so to solve this, we do this thing of trying a solution x proportional to e to the lambda t, and then figure out what lambda has to be. So if we plug that solution into our equation of motion, we find uh, lambda has to be uh, minus gamma plus or minus the square root of gamma squared minus omega naught squared. Okay, and so this from this um, solution we get different kinds of damping. We get light damping, critical damping, and heavy damping. So I've already talked about critical and heavy damping in my last couple of videos. Um, so let me first um, say something about light damping. So light damping is what happens when uh, gamma is less than omega naught. So if you look at this expression up here for lambda, um, you can see if gamma is less than omega naught, the thing inside the square root is negative, which means that lambda is going to be complex, it's going to have an imaginary part. And when you have an exponential function, um, and the exponent has an imaginary part, then you get an oscillating solution. Um, and so when gamma is less than omega naught, the general solution for this light damping case is as follows. So we've got x as a function of time is e to the minus gamma t, and then you have some constant a times um, cos of the square root of omega naught squared minus gamma squared times time, and then some contribution from a sine as well. So this b is another constant. These a and b constants depend on the initial conditions. And yeah, we've got sine of the same thing, square root of omega naught squared minus gamma squared times the time. Okay. So that's the light damping case, and the critical and heavy damping cases I've talked about before, but I'm just going to write those out as well, just for completeness. So the critical case is what you get when gamma is exactly equal to omega naught, um, and in that case the solution looks like this. So this time you still have an e to the uh, minus gamma t, um, but then this time you've got um, some constant, I'm going to call this a prime, so this prime isn't like a derivative, it's just to show that this a prime is not the same as the a in the previous solution, it can be a different number, um, and then we've got some other constant which I'm going to call b prime times time, okay, that's the critically damped solution. And the final case, um, which I talked about in the last video, is the heavy case, um, that's when gamma is bigger than omega naught, and then um, this lambda that we had um, as our solution, this is then purely real, and there are two distinct values of that. Um, and so what we get for the heavy case is some contribution, again I'm going to put an extra prime here to show that this constant is different from the previous ones. So you've got some constant a double prime, and then e to the minus gamma um, plus the square root of gamma squared minus omega naught squared. Uh, all multiplied by time, right? That's just lambda times t, and then we get a contribution from the other lambda as well, so some other constant, and then e to the minus lambda, but this, sorry, minus gamma, and this time minus sign here, uh, gamma squared minus omega naught squared, um, and all multiplied by t. So these are the different um, regimes of um, motion that we get depending on the damping, like whether Gamma, the damping coefficient, is less than or equal to or greater than the, the natural frequency omega naught of the system. So, um, let's think about um, the time scales involved here. Okay, and by time scale, 
I mean how long it takes for the amplitude of the motion to decay by a significant amount. And it's a bit of a loosely de defined concept, but when we have an exponential decay, usually we define the kind of decay time scale to be the time it takes for your quantity to decay to a factor of 1 over e of its initial value. Okay, and so what does that mean? If we think about the um, decay time scales, right, let's have a look at the light damping case um, first. Okay, so notice that you've got a cos and you've got a sine. These things are not decaying, right, these are just oscillating. The thing that's causing the decay is the e to the minus gamma t in front. And if we define our decay time scale to be the time it takes for the, for the amplitude of the motion to go to 1 over e of what it started as, then um, basically we want to have a factor of e to the minus 1 in front of our x of t, right? Because e to the minus 1 is 1 over e. And so we're looking for the condition that um, gamma times time or gamma times the decay time scale is equal to 1, because then you're going to have e to the minus 1 in front of your expression. So what that means is if I denote the decay time scale as uh, tau, um, then for the light case, because we've got e to the minus gamma t, the um, decay time scale tau is just going to be 1 over gamma, right? Because if um, t is equal to 1 over gamma, then you've got e to the minus gamma times 1 over gamma, which is e to the minus 1. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a characteristic time scale that tells you how quickly the amplitude um, decays. And how about for the critical case? Um, well, actually, you've also, the decaying part of the solution is also this e to the minus gamma t um, in the front, right? And so actually, for the critical case, the decay time scale is the same. Um, so it's 1 over gamma. We can also write that as 1 over omega naught in this case because the critical case is defined as the scenario when gamma is equal to omega naught, right? So these two are the same for the critical case. So how about the heavy damping case? So let's think about that. Um, so let's do that up here. So for the heavy case, there are two decaying exponentials, right? Um, because you've got two distinct values of lambda which are both real. So you end up with two time scales, and I'm going to call them tau plus and tau minus. And um, again, you know, we're defining the damping time scale as the time it takes for your exponential to decay to 1 over e of what it started as. And so in a similar way to when we had uh, minus gamma t in, uh, as, our, as our exponent, because we have these two distinct exponents, you know, this one here and this one here, in the heavy damping case, basically we get 1 over or minus 1 over each of those things as our two decay time scales. So decay time scales are going to be 1 over um, gamma plus or minus the square root of um, gamma squared minus omega naught squared. Okay, so two distinct time scales. And so what I want to do is actually sketch a graph illustrating how this decay time scale depends on gamma. So let me draw a um, set of axes over here, like this and like this. Okay, so what I'm going to sketch is um, the decay time scale tau as a function of gamma, this kind of damping coefficient. All right, so when um, omega naught well, when gamma is less than omega naught, we're in the light regime, and then our decay time scale looks like 1 over gamma, right? So the first part of this curve is just going to be a, a like a y equals 1 over x kind of curve. So I can draw in a line that looks, um, trying to get a nice smooth curve here, something like this, right? That's just like a y equals 1 over x type curve. I'm going to draw like a dot at the end of that, and that special point there, that's when gamma is equal to omega naught, and then um, this value here is going to be 1 over omega naught. Okay, so this is just a plotting tau equals 1 over gamma for the light regime. Okay, then for the critical regime, well, the critical part of this graph is at this point, which I've highlighted, right? This kind of, uh, kind of dot uh, that I've drawn there. That only applies at that exact point. Um, 
and yeah, the dampening times you get there is just 1 over omega naught. So let's think about how to sketch the curves for the heavy damping time scales. So to do that, um, I'm going to manipulate this expression a bit. I'm going to write that as, I'm going to take out a 1 over gamma, and then what I have to have here is um, 1 over, so because I've factorized out a gamma, we just get a 1, and then plus or minus, again because we factorized it, a gamma, um, you're going to get 1 minus omega naught squared over gamma squared inside the square root. Okay, um, so those are the two time scales. So far I haven't done anything to them, I've just kind of manipulated the expression a bit. The reason for doing that is that I want to see how these curves look, and to do that I'm going to take the limit as gamma gets really big, as gamma goes to infinity, so we can see roughly how these two curves look for tau plus and tau minus as a function of gamma. So um, what I'm going to do is say so this is approximately equal to, when gamma is really big, um, this 1 over gamma is still out of the front, and then I'm going to do a binomial expansion of this square root, right? because if gamma is much bigger than omega naught, then omega naught squared over gamma squared is much less than 1, and we can do a binomial expansion on that thing. And so because the square root is um, like the stuff inside, all to the power of a half, um, this is equal to 1 plus or minus, so the first term of this binomial expansion is going to be 1, and then you get a minus or plus 1 half of omega naught squared over gamma squared, right? So this is just using the fact that um, 1 plus x to the n can be um, approximated, or well, if you have an infinite number of terms, you can write this as basically 1 plus nx plus higher order terms, right? So I've just taken that and applied it to this square root case where n is a half and our kind of x here is um, minus omega naught squared over gamma squared. Okay, and so let's think about the two time scales separately now. So when gamma goes to infinity, the plus time scale, the one where we initially had a plus sign here, um, what that one does is, well, you're going to have 1 over gamma, and then you're going to have 1 over 1 plus 1 minus this extra stuff, right? And so, because gamma is really big, we can actually ignore that last term, and then we just get 1 over 1 plus 1, which is a half. So this time scale tends towards just 1 over 2 gamma. And the other time scale, tau minus, is slightly different, because what we get is 1 over gamma, but then the 1's cancel, right, on the denominator of the next part, because you've got 1 minus 1, um, and so there's no constant term, so we have to go to the next order. So you get 1 minus 1, and then plus um, half omega naught squared over gamma squared. So we, here we just get half omega naught squared over gamma squared, and if you um, just simplify this, right, that's the same as 2 gamma over omega naught um, squared. Okay, so now we can sketch these curves out, right, because we've seen, um, let's think about tau plus first, so that's 1 over 2 gamma, so we've already sketched, we've started sketching 1 over gamma on this curve, so 1 over 2 gamma um, is going to pass through this, this dot that I've drawn here, right, this critical point, but it's going to be kind of more steeply curved than just 1 over gamma, so that's going to look something like like this, or is this going to keep decaying? Okay, so that's this is 1 over 2 gamma, that's um, our tau plus, and then we can see that tau minus um, it's also going to start at the same point, right, because when gamma um, is equal to omega naught um, then the square root term just, just disappears, um, but as gamma gets really big you just got tau minus tending towards something that's proportional to gamma, which is like a straight line, y equals a constant times x, right? And so we can draw in a curve that looks something like this, starts off kind of curved, but then it tends towards a straight line, right? So the gradient of this thing is, is um, tending towards just a constant, which is 2 over omega naught squared. Okay. Um, Actually, I realize I've labeled this 1 over 2 gamma, that's not strictly correct, right, because that's the approximation. So what I'm going to do is just label this one as tau plus, 
and this one as tau minus. Okay, so in the left part of this curve, that's the light damping regime, on the right part of the of the um, this plot, that's the heavy damping regime, and then the critical bit only applies at this special point in the middle. Okay, so what can we learn from this? Well, first let's think about the time scale um, to return to equilibrium. So time scale to return to equilibrium. All right, so the idea is we start our um, oscillator in some position and then we say after how long um, is it kind of back to its to its equilibrium state, right? And so for the light and critical damping cases that's fairly straightforward because we just have one damping time scale um, and so the time scale to return to equilibrium is like the same thing as how long it takes your amplitude to decay and so the time scale for the, the light and critical cases would just be uh, 1 over gamma or this this tau, right? So it's just tau but for the heavy damping case it's a bit less obvious maybe because you've got two different time scales so which one do we care about? And to answer that I'm going to do another uh, little um, sketch, okay? So this is a different thing that I'm sketching now. Let me draw some axes. And this time I'm going to sketch position x against uh, time t, okay? And now I'm sketching this for the, the heavy damping uh, case. So basically what happens is because you've got these two different time scales involved, if you look at this uh, this plot here at the top, for the heavy damping case, there's two different branches of the curve, right? And you've got tau plus, which is quite small, and tau minus, which is quite big. So you've got two different decay modes going on, going on, and one of them is really fast. One of them decays quickly, the other one decays slowly. So it depends a bit on the initial conditions, but basically the form of graph that you end up getting if you sketch position against time for a heavily damped system, you kind of get this fast decay initially, right? So this is from the uh, tau plus decay time scale. If I can draw that, uh, yeah, I guess that's all right. So you get this fast decay, but then that kind of term has fully decayed, but you're still left with the slower decaying term, right? Because that takes much longer to disappear. So after this initial kind of fast decay, it tends to kind of level off and you get this much slower decay like that. So you can kind of think of, you know, think of there as being two regimes. At first the fast damping timescale dominates and at later times the slow damping timescale dominates because the fast one has already basically disappeared, it's decayed away. So here the damping timescale is basically tau plus and here it's basically um, tau minus. So if we want to know how long it takes to actually get back towards x, um, x being close to zero, right? Um, the time scale that's going to matter is tau minus, right? Because this tau plus term just decays really quickly and just leaves us with the tau minus term. So in the long term, it's the, it's the tau minus one that determines um, how long it takes to actually get back to equilibrium, okay? And um, so what does that mean? Well, if we forget about this tau plus branch for the moment, because it's the minus one, that, that, that tells us how long it takes to get back to equilibrium, you've then got a curve that starts um, at really high values, it goes down to a minimum at the critical point, and then it comes back up, right? And so you can see that this critically damped case is actually at a, um, at a minimum in this curve of time scale to return to equilibrium as a function of um, damping uh, damping coefficient, right? So this is the origin of the same that you may have encountered before, that um, critical damping gives you the fastest return to equilibrium. So we've seen how we can use this idea of damping time scale to deduce that critical damping gives us the fastest possible return to equilibrium for a, a damped oscillator. And now let's do something else which is quite interesting. Um, with this, with these damping time scales. So going back to this idea of overshoot, right? So as a reminder, if a system overshoots, that means you've started it at some position and then it's kind of 
cross through the equilibrium point and then it comes back to equilibrium, right? Rather than just staying on one side of equilibrium, gradually coming back, it actually goes through equilibrium before coming back to settle um, at that equilibrium point. Um, so I want to now, previously I've done this in a quite a mathematical way, now I'm going to do it in a simple way involving a physical argument about time scales. And so to start with, Let's consider the following. So let's consider the time scale um, for our, let's say we've got a mass on a spring, right? We want to know how long does it take for the mass to um, travel a distance. Uh, I'm going to say modulus of x naught at a uh, speed of modulus of v naught. And because, uh, well, time is just distance over speed, right, that time scale is going to be modulus of x naught over modulus of v naught. So what's the point of doing this? Um, well, so here x naught and v naught I'm thinking of as like the initial conditions of the system, right? So we displace our mass to a position of x naught and we give it a speed of v naught towards the origin. And so what I'm asking here, what I'm calculating here, is like if we assume that the speed of the mass doesn't change um, and you've just pulled it out to a position of x naught and given it initial velocity of v naught towards the origin, towards the equilibrium position, how long would it take to do that? Okay, so of course the velocity actually is changing, but here we're just doing this in a kind of rough way um, and doing this in a kind of uh, physically intuitive way rather than a mathematically rigorous way, right? So if we drag it out to a position of x naught, give it a speed of v naught, and say, assuming nothing actually happens to the speed or the velocity of that mass, how long, do it take to the get, how long does it take to get to the origin? That's just going to be the distance over the speed. Okay. So what we can then do is think about how that relates to the damping time scale. So you would actually expect, you would expect overshoot um, to occur if the above time scale, so if that time scale we just calculated, if that um, is shorter than the uh, damping time scale. So why is that? Well, basically, you know, you can think of the damping time scale as like how long does it take for the system to become damped, right? And damping is a deceleration, right? It's a reduction in velocity. Damping forces always oppose the velocity, right? And so the damping time scale can also be thought of as like how long does it take for the damping to significantly change or significantly reduce the speed um, that the mass is going with, right? And so if this time that we've just calculated, this time to travel from a distance x naught back to the origin, if that is much faster or much shorter than the amount of time it takes for damping to actually do anything significant, then we'd expect it to go straight through the origin, right? Because damping um, won't have actually had a chance to significantly affect the velocity. Um, and so what does that mean? So let's think about the simpler case first, which is the critical case. As a reminder, I'm not going to say anything about um, light damping here because um, well, this concept of overshoot doesn't really um, apply to light damping because when you have light damping, it's oscillating, right? So it's going through the origin um, in principle infinitely many times. Um, but anyway, for the critical case, right, the condition for overshoot would then be the thing that we calculated mod x naught over mod v naught. That should be less than the damping time scale that we calculated, which is 1 over gamma, right? Which can be rewritten as v naught is bigger than gamma, uh, the modulus of v naught is bigger than gamma times the modulus of x naught, and again remember this has to be pointing towards the origin. Okay, and a few videos ago I derived this same result in a more rigorous way, um, but interestingly just by considering this idea of time scales, we've kind of figured it out this way as well. Okay, so how about the heavy case? So for the heavy case, um, the difficulty here compared with the critical case is again identifying which of the two damping time scales uh, we need to put on the right hand side of this inequality. And remember 
if you think back to the graph I drew earlier, right, we had two parts to the motion. Firstly, you've got this fast decay at short times of x, and then at later times you've got a much slower decay because you've got these two decay modes, a fast one and a slow one. And so actually, previously, when we think about how long it takes to come back to equilibrium, it was the slower time scale that we cared about because that dominates the motion at later times. But when we think about overshoot, actually, we care about what the system is doing initially, right? Because you start it, you pull the mass out to a position of x0, you give it a velocity of um, v0, and the subsequent motion, like immediately after that, is going to be dominated by the quickly decaying term, right? The faster decaying term. So that dominates the nature of the motion at short times. And so the time scale we need here is actually the shorter damping time scale, which is the one with a plus in the denominator. So we get gamma plus the square root of gamma squared minus omega naught squared. And um, this can be rewritten as v naught um, is bigger than gamma plus the square root of gamma squared minus omega naught squared um, times modulus of x naught. So in my previous video I called this whole thing, oh sorry, not that whole thing, but I called this bit alpha, and um, that is exactly the same result as I wrote before in a more uh, rigorous way, right? So again, it's I find it quite interesting that you can just use this time scale argument about can the mass reach the equilibrium position quicker than damping can do anything. Just from that simple idea we can get to the same results. Um, so yeah, I think it's quite quite neat that we can understand this, this result physically as well as doing it in a more rigorous mathematical way. Okay, so there's a few more videos I would like to make in this little series on uh, damped harmonic motion. In my next one I'm planning to um, again think about critical and heavy damping this time thinking about the relationship between the two of them and how critical damping can be thought of as like the limiting case of heavy damping.